Well, if you'll take your copy of the scripture and turn with me, whether it's electronic or print, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we are going to be in verses 11 through 15 this morning. And here at Faith Baptist Church, we are committed to expository preaching. Now, some of you may be familiar with that term and know what it means. Some of you may have heard that term and aren't quite sure, and others might be, huh? But, but expository preaching is a very important aspect of the church's uh, mission and, and what the proclamation of the word entails. And different pastors and theologians have defined this uh, model a little bit differently, but they all agree on the central tenets of it. And I think they're best described by Tim Keller in his book, Preaching, Communicating Faith in an Age of Skepticism. Keller describes it as expository preaching grounds the message of the text so that all the sermon's points are the points in the text, and it majors in the text's major ideas. It aligns the interpretation of the text with the doctrinal truths of the rest of the Bible, and it always situates the passage within the Bible's narrative, showing how Christ is the final fulfillment of the text's theme. So expository preaching is best accomplished by verse-by-verse exposition through books of the Bible, and that's the model that we follow here. It allows us to explore the context, the themes, and the grammatical structures that the author has in order to keep his intention in full view. Now, that doesn't mean that pastors cannot preach on topics, and, and they should preach on topics. But it ought to be done in an expository manner. And when it is done in that way, it protects both the pastor and the church from sermons that are merely topical talks in search of a supporting scripture. In other words, expository preaching serves as a safeguard against the opinions of the pastor being forced onto the text. And one of the great benefits of this model of preaching in the local church is that the church receives a balanced diet of what Paul would describe as the whole counsel of God in Acts 20.27. Difficult texts, and frankly texts that have become distasteful to our modern sensibilities, cannot be avoided if one is committed to expository preaching. And at at the heart of expository preaching is the unshakable confidence that every single word of the scripture is God-breathed and therefore is profitable for God's people. Now this morning, we come to a text that is difficult and has become distasteful to many in the church and frankly in our society as a whole. And it's difficult for a number of reasons. First of all, it directly contradicts our culture. Second, it has been used to oppress and bludgeon women. And three, it ends with a verse that has been notoriously difficult to interpret. So lots of people would like to just avoid this. I cannot. And I believe that by engaging this text this morning... We are going to reap many blessings from God. We're going to have a stronger faith. We're going to have a better understanding of God's grace. We're going to have a better understanding of God's order for his church. And we're going to have an assurance that God's word is just as applicable in the 21st century as it was in the first. So will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Beginning in the 11th verse of the second chapter of 1 Timothy, Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Father, we always pause to give you thanks for your word because we know the wisdom it contains. We know the transformative power of your word. And most of all, we know that by your revealed word, the gospel is made clear to us. And so then we can know both our position as sinners 
and your great grace for us. There are passages, O oh Lord, that you have inspired by your Holy Spirit that are difficult. We readily admit this. And it does cut across and against our flesh, our desires, and our culture. But Father, I pray that as we come to this, that we would give grace to one another if our understanding of this text differs somewhat. But Father, that all of us would long for and strive for conforming ourselves to the text and not the text to our views. We ask this by the power of the Spirit and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, to say that these instructions have been disputed is an understatement. These are disputed verses in the history of the church over the last 150 years or so. These verses have been abused and ignored, and Christ's church is the poorer for it. Much of this misunderstanding, especially when it comes to deploying this as a proof text for the maltreatment of women, arises from ignoring the context in which this letter was written. And so a brief reminder of that context is important as we begin our study of this passage. Paul wrote this letter to Timothy in order to help his young protege address some issues that were going on in Ephesus to correct errors of false teaching that were happening there. We see that in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, we also see in the other pastoral epistle to, to Titus that he had sent Titus to Crete in order to set things in order in the churches there. And that's the same thing that Timothy is doing in Ephesus. So the overall theme of this letter is how we are to go about living the church life. And the immediate context of these verses reminds us that Paul is not talking in broad, general terms, but he is talking specifically about how things are to take place in the corporate worship setting of the church. And so we see this and we see three instructions. The first instruction that Paul gives here has to do with learning. We see this in verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Now this command raises the hackles of feminists, but I want you to understand this morning, right now, that this raised the hackles of everybody in the first century. And you may say, wait a minute, what? How, how would this offend people and, and, and make them upset? You have to understand that it doesn't matter if we're talking about the Jewish culture in which many of the Christians came out of or we're talking about the Gentile Greek culture that many of the non-Jewish believers came out of. The idea of women learning was revolutionary. This simply did not happen. In Jewish culture, women could go to the synagogue, but it wasn't really expected, nor was it encouraged. And some rabbis even went so far as to say to teach a woman the things of the Torah were to cast your pearls before swine. That is how it was. We just did not do it. In fact, uh, in the, uh, the Jerusalem uh, Talmud, there was a rabbinic teaching that it was better to let the words of the Torah burn than to allow a woman to teach them. That's how serious this was and how low women were held in that way. In Hellenized society, the Greek society that characterized Ephesus, it wasn't any better. There was very little opportunity for them to learn. William Barclay, one uh, of the commentators of church history, said that women in this culture lived a very confined life. He said they were confined to their homes. They really they had their quarters in the house, but nobody went into the quarters except for the husband. And, and they didn't go out into society. They certainly didn't go to any public assemblies, and they most certainly did not teach or question men in public. But this is very different in Christianity. Look at what Paul says here. He says, let a woman learn. That's huge. Now, we'll get into the details in a moment, but... but don't just skip over this. Within the church, women are not only allowed to learn, they are encouraged and expected to do so. 
That's revolutionary. That is God's grace. People will sometimes say Christianity is so oppressive to women. No, listen, everywhere Christianity went in the world, women's status was raised. Women became considered equal with men on a spiritual level so that you could come to Christ, you could come and learn. That's, that's an amazing thing. But it would seem that this newfound freedom had created some disorder within the church, and that had been the case in Corinth, and we'll see some examples from that this morning as well. So Paul sets forth some parameters here for how women were to learn in the corporate worship setting, and he begins by saying that they should learn quietly. Now notice in verses 11 and 12, there's a contrast here, isn't there? In the corporate worship setting, women are forbidden from teaching while being instructed to learn quietly. And that learning is to be undertaken with submissiveness to the leadership as opposed to exercising authority or leadership over men in the church. And we'll explore that more, but we need to see that contrast. We need to see that in verses 11 and 12. Paul's using them uh, to, to make his point here. But what does this quietness mean? Does it mean that women are to be absolutely silent in the church and never speak and never do anything? Well, some have pointed to 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 to suggest this is the case. And some translations even render our passage this morning, let a woman learn in silence instead of quietly, but quietly is the better translation here. In, in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, Paul writes, the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, context is critical here, because if we don't understand the context, if we rip these verses out and just try to make them stand on their own, we will come up with some crazy interpretations and bad interpretations, okay? This word for quiet is not a word for absolute silence. It is a word for respectfulness. In fact, it's the same word that Luke uses at the end of Acts and when Paul is on his last visit to Jerusalem and the mob forms, right? The mob is out there, they're yelling, they're screaming. And Luke says, first of all, the, when, when Paul went to address them, the crowd hushed, they became silent. And then as Paul started talking, then they became quiet. Well, now they were hushed already, so quiet doesn't mean the same thing. No, that word actually means that they became respectful to what was being said. So this quietness is inseparable from the submissiveness that Paul describes here. It's a voluntary yielding to the authority in the church that's been established and ordained by God in the elders who are doing the teaching. Now in verse 12, Paul explains what he means in verse 11. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man Rather, she is to remain quiet. Again, that respectful aspect here. And we'll consider these two aspects, teaching and exercising authority, separately. But let's begin with teaching. Paul says, with apostolic authority, I do not permit. This is not his opinion. It is not something that is culturally bound to the first century Ephesus church. This is an apostolic command given by the inspiration of God for all people in all places at all times. But that has become an explosive issue in the church today, hasn't it? And so we would be right to ask ourselves, has this always been a point of contention in God's churches? And the answer to that is no, it hasn't. It has become an issue over about the last 150 years. We look back to about the mid-1800s when you start seeing women ordained to uh, the pastorate, to the elder position. Uh, begins in the United Church of Christ, actually, in about 1853. And then other denominations uh, start doing that as well. A few do. Um, and, and it really picks up steam, actually, in the 1960s. And we can understand why if we understand a little bit about world history as well during that time. Okay, for thousands of years, the church understood these instructions as they're presented. But with the rise of modern feminism, 
that understanding's been jettisoned so that we can adopt a more modern understanding of equality. So what's this teaching that Paul prohibits women from engaging in? New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner put it this way. He said, it's the public transmission of authoritative material. Now, some have tried to negate this command by saying that women could teach men or mixed audiences, provided that they do not teach scripture in an authoritative manner, or that they're teaching under the authority of the elders. The problem with that interpretation is this. Scripture doesn't give that room. That's something that you have to put on to Scripture because it's not here. Paul doesn't say women teach in a non-authoritative manner because here's the real issue. Can you teach Scripture in a non-authoritative authoritative way? And the answer is no. Scripture is always authoritative. And likewise, elders and the responsibility that they have and the authority they have cannot be used as a cover for doing something that is expressly prohibited by God's word. But does this mean that all teaching is, is off limits, that all teaching is prohibited? Well, not at all. Titus 2, 3 through 5 provides an example of women teaching other women in the context of the church life. And likewise, women have a responsibility for transmitting the word of God to children. That is one of the primary things. Now listen, men, you have a responsibility in your homes for teaching the children as well the word of God. But what we see in scripture is that that's a, uh, something that falls naturally to mothers in this case. Now I'm going to tell you something else that might surprise some of you. Scripture does give the case for women teaching men in a private setting. You have to look to Acts for this. Acts 18, we find that Priscilla and Aquila, her husband, taught Apollos in Acts chapter 18, 26, but they did so privately in their home. It was not in the corporate worship setting. There does not seem to be any prohibition in Scripture for that. And, and brothers, let me just ask you, this is a rhetorical question. Have you ever learned anything from your wives? <laughs> I hope so. I know I have. I'm thankful for the faithfulness of my wife. I'm thankful for the way that she studies God's word. I, I'm thankful for the way that she hears from the Holy Spirit in her life. Okay, I hear that. And I'm thankful for it. But that is not the same as teaching authoritatively in the context of the corporate worship service like we are doing right now. That is what is expressly prohibited in Scripture. Now, the last aspect of this disputed instruction has to do with women exercising authority over men in the church life. And once again, this verse has been ripped out of context in order to say a lot of things that it was never meant to say. It's often been used to assert that women cannot exert any authority or have any position of authority over a man, such as in the secular workplace or law enforcement or uh, elected office. I mean, I've heard people say many times that, you know, I'm not going to submit to a female cop. Well, good luck with that. They have tasers too. You will submit. <laughs> and it is not wrong for a woman to hold that position. It is not wrong for a woman to be a boss in the secular workplace. It is not wrong for a woman to hold an elected office. Those are outside of the context of what Paul is discussing here, which is, again, how the household of God, as he would describe it later in chapter 3, is to conduct itself when it gathers together. So we are, we've got to keep this within the realm of spiritual leadership in the context of the local church. Now we'll see momentarily when we get to those rationales that Paul gives for why this is the case. God has established a specific order in how he created humanity. He began with man, and then we also see examples from the fall that Eve was deceived. Because this is the God-ordained order from the beginning, it is not a culturally bound situation. You see, if Paul said 
you know, women are not allowed to teach in the church because obviously in our culture, women are held to a much lower standard. Well, today, women are not held to the same standard as they were in first century uh, uh, Greek and Roman society. The role of women have been elevated. The position now, we're, there's certainly still, we can talk about issues with that, but we absolutely must say it is not the same as it was in the first century, okay? And to argue that Paul's prohibition here is just the result of his cultural bias or his patriarchy or his misogyny is actually to ignore the liberating aspect of this passage that we have just seen in the terms of allowing women to learn, encouraging and expecting them to do so. Now listen, here's the issue with that. Does that not just sound natural to us today? That women ought to learn? I think every one of us here today would say, of course they should. Of course they ought to learn. Of course they should be encouraged to learn and grow in their faith and their knowledge of God's word. But that was not so in many places, in most places, in the first century. And guess what? Even today, many places around the world, it is not the case. So let's not just assume because we here in the West encourage that, that that was the case in first century uh, Roman and Greek society. So, so that's not what's happening here. Paul is not prohibiting the exercise of authority in all cases, just in the case of spiritual leadership within the church. Now, some have argued that, that what Paul is talking about here is not the exercise of authority, but the abuse of authority, that women can, can hold the position of pastor or elder as long as they're not being abusive or overbearing in their exercise of it. But here's the problem with that interpretation. Does that mean men can? Not at all. Listen, it is just as offensive to God for a man to abuse spiritual authority, if he is an elder or whatever you want to call it, as it would be for anybody to hold it. So why would Paul just single out women here if that's all he meant? That's not What's being said here, there's something completely different. So, so this command recognizes that there is something in our flesh that is disordered because of the fall. And it has to do with authority. And it has to do with the desire of women. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments. But for right now, and listen, men, we have disordered desires as well, but that's beyond the scope of this message. It's beyond the scope of this passage to get into that. But, but what Paul is addressing here is the disordered desire in the part of women for authority. You see, this goes back to the fall. Part of the curse that's given to, to the woman is found in the latter half of Genesis 3.16, God says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. There's going to be a conflict. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. We'll flesh that out. Okay? So Paul's not arguing only against abusive authority exercised by women. He's stating plainly a prohibition against women exercising spiritual leadership in the church. And that's saying they can't exercise the role of elder, overseer, pastor. Those, those words in scripture are interchangeable, okay? That's, that's what is, uh, is there. They, they, they are synonyms for the same role. And that role is expressly reserved for men. We see that in the qualifications that are put for, forth in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, which we'll see next week, and also Titus 1, 5 through 9. Listen, it's not coincidental that Paul launches into a discussion of the qualifications of elders and says explicitly that they are to be men, husbands of one wife, right after he just finished discussing this issue of women exercising authority and the prohibition against that. And we're going to discuss that more next week, so I'm not going to dwell on that right now either. But given Paul's linkage of teaching and spiritual authority, we should take a moment to ask the question, is a woman permitted to bring a message to the church when it's gathered corporately to worship the Lord? In other words, can a woman preach, if, if she's not the pastor, if she's not an elder, can she come on Sunday morning to the, to the gathered body of Christ, the church, 
and preach? Well, Paul's answer would be an unambiguous no here, and it has to do with the role of preaching in the corporate worship service as authority. Listen, when I stand here in the pulpit, I am not speaking to you out of my own authority. I don't have any authority in myself over any one of you. But when I stand in the pulpit, when I come here and I open the word of God and we begin working through passages like we're doing, I am speaking with authority. But the authority that I have is the word of God. Listen, my opinion doesn't matter. God's word does. And I have to conform myself to it whether I think that it's a good argument or a bad argument, no matter where I am on it, I have to come to that and say, Lord, if, if I don't like this, there's something wrong with me. Fix me. Bring your conviction on my spirit and let me repent of where I am in rebellion against your perfect word. So whenever anyone stands in the pulpit addressing the church on Sunday morning, proclaiming the word, they are doing so with authority. There is no other way to preach a sermon than with authority. It's impossible. It's especially impossible if you are preaching the word. Now, if you get up here and just give a talk or a motivational speech, then, yeah, it's, it, well, it's not preaching, first of all. And it ought not be taking the place of preaching in the church either. But we have to be clear here. There is no way to deliver a non-authoritative sermon because Scripture is always authoritative and it gives authority to the one proclaiming it. Now, having given these instructions for women in the church life, Paul proceeds to explain these instructions. And these explanations are quite distasteful in our culture today to our world because the world rejects them. It does not like these explanations. But just because the world rejects them, just because they may be distasteful to us, does not mean that they are not profitable for us. And if we ourselves find these two explanations distasteful, then we need to search our hearts and conform our thoughts to God's word and not God's word to our fleshly values. Now, Paul begins by citing the created order here. We see that in verse 13. He says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. In other words, man was created first and then the woman, which is what we see in the Genesis account, isn't it? When we go to Genesis 2, this is what we find. God created Adam out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into Adam the breath of life. And Paul would make this same argument over in 1 Corinthians 11.8. He says, for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. And this chronological priority, which is established prior to the fall, is rooted in divine revelation, not human opinion, and in divine creation, not human culture. That's, that's how John Stott put it. And he goes on to say, in essence, therefore, it must be preserved as having permanent and universal authority. Now listen, there's a lot of us who do not like Paul's argument from the chronology of creation. And there's a lot of people who argue, this is a really weak argument. I could give you numerous commentaries that will tell you this is a weak argument on Paul's behalf. Here's the problem. Is this just Paul's opinion or is it the divinely inspired word of God? That's the question we have to ask. And if we're going to say this is not divinely inspired, this is just opinion, then what else is? Where do we draw that line? Where do we stop and say this is scripture and this is not? When we start picking and choosing what we're going to believe and what we're going to conform to in the word of God, it is a slippery slope into sinfulness that will eventually lead into apostasy. It can be no other way because you will start removing the parts of scripture that are really distasteful to your flesh. 
Now what's more, we see that Paul says the woman was created for the man, not the man for the woman. We see that in Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. This is God's divine design. And he decided to create the man and the woman in this order, and he created the woman to be the helper to the man. Now let me ask you a question. Could God have created Adam and Eve at the same time, both out of the dust of the ground, if he wanted to establish that they would be perfectly equal on every single thing and in every single role? Yes. God could have done that. God did not do that. God created man first, And then he created Eve as a helper for Adam. And Paul expressed this same understanding of the Genesis text in 1 Corinthians 11.9. He said, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. The order that God has instituted in creation is to be the order reflected in the leadership of the church. Because it is his church. And while the foundation of Paul's argument is found in creation before the fall, he also goes on to cite the fall as a reason, as a corroborating evidence for this explanation. Read verse 14 with me again. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now some have concluded from this verse that women are naturally more gullible than men or or they're more naive than men or they're not trustworthy or or they've come up with all kinds of bad interpretations of this text. That's not what's being said here. I want to be incredibly clear on that. I have met a lot of gullible men. I have met a lot of naive men, and I have met a lot of untrustworthy men. Listen, those conditions are not endemic to one gender or the other. They are endemic to humanity. And if that's what we're going to take from this, we're missing Paul's point. Because that's not what he's communicating here. No, at the heart of Paul's use of the account of the fall is the relationship between the deception of Eve and the responsibility of Adam. And we find that in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. There, Adam is given the command from God to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Guess when God gave him that command? Before Eve was created. God told Adam, Adam, you can eat anything in this garden except... From the, tr- from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's off limits. That's, that's your one rule. You know, today we'd say you had one job, right? And Adam dropped it. It was his responsibility to teach Eve the command of God. After Eve had been created from his rib... He had the responsibility to teach Eve about this one command. And guess what? It appears he did so. Because when Eve is at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the serpent comes, she knows the command, doesn't she? Now, there's some additional stuff in there that she says, like, oh, we're we're not even to touch it. Well, God never said that. Maybe Adam added that as kind of a fencing, I don't know. Maybe Eve thought, well, you know, if I can't eat it, I better not even touch it. And that just became part. We don't know exactly why she added that. That's not in the text. But what matters is that she did know what it was. She knew what this particular fruit was, that it was forbidden. And yet, when the serpent questions God's commandments, Eve is deceived. But her choice to eat of that fruit is not the result of naivety. She knew what God expected. It was a willing rebellion against the created order. That's what we have to see here. Eve willingly rebelled. It wasn't gullibility. It wasn't naiveness. It was rebellion. Philip Jensen, a conservative Anglican from Australia, he explained it this way. He said, Eve's sin involved overturning the order of creation and teaching her husband. Similarly, Adam's sin came from listening to his wife in the sense of heeding and following her instruction. He was taught by her, thereby putting himself under her authority and reversing God's good ordering of creation. Now, hear me carefully. 
This does not absolve Adam of his responsibility because Adam abdicated his ordained position as the head of his wife, Eve. And indeed, when Paul speaks of being the representative of the fallen human race, he does not speak of Eve. He speaks of Adam. Read with me Romans 5, 14 and 15. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. You see, when God came to the garden, guess what? He didn't ask for Eve. He didn't call out and say, Eve, where are you? He called for Adam. And when he asked what had been done, he didn't say, Eve, what did you do? He said, Adam, what did you do? You see, Adam had the responsibility here. It was Adam's point of, of, of responsibility. He was representing not only his wife, but ultimately the whole human race. And I think it's interesting that only Adam was given the curse of death. If you look at the curse that's given in Genesis 3, Genesis 3.19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see, but because Adam represents the whole human race, death enters and applies to everyone, men and women alike. And now, in God's order for the church, men are to lead not because women are incapable, not because women are not gifted, not because they're unable to teach, not because they are gullible or untrustworthy, not on any basis of their merit. Men are to lead because it is the order God has established in creation. And the fall is a vivid reminder of what happens when we begin to think that we know better than God about what the right order should be. Now, there are times when Peter's words in 2 Peter 3.16 particularly resonate with me. There he's speaking of Paul's letters, and, and the apostle Peter writes, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Yeah, and verse 15 is one of them. Peter goes on to say, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. I've shown you how some have twisted these preceding scriptures to their own destruction. They've brought it into the church. They have, have upset the order and they've brought divisiveness over an issue that was never a divisive issue. Because we're not saying that women are unequal to men in the sight of God. Scripture makes that very clear. Men and women are equal to one another. We are equal in our sinfulness and we are equal in our capacity to receive God's grace. We are equal before God, and we all stand before him with neither male nor female. But just because we have spiritual equality doesn't mean that our roles are the same. God in his divine design has established different roles for men and women, and that's okay. And that is a good thing, in fact. So what does Paul mean here? When he says, yet shall she be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Saved through childbearing. This is an interesting phrase. We're going to get into it here. And there's an interpretative challenge to this. And it's presented because there's, there's been various ways of understanding it. I'm going to run through three of them very quickly with you. First of all, some have read this passage to mean that Christian women will be kept safe during childbirth, during the physical process of childbirth, that they will be kept safe. In fact, this understanding is reflected in the 1978 translation of the NIV, which says women will be kept safe through childbirth. Now, subsequent editions of the NIV changed that to read more like what the ESV reads that we read this morning, she will be saved through childbearing or through childbirth. Okay? Now those who have advanced this understanding have said the curse given to Eve makes very clear the pain associated with childbirth. And I see a lot of ladies out here. I see a lot of mothers out here. I know you understand that. 
I don't. I don't. I know it's painful. I don't know how painful, but I know it's painful. And the curse says it will be. And it's also dangerous. Throughout the history of humanity, maternal mortality rates have been high in giving birth. And that's the problem with this interpretation, is that there have been many Christian women who have died in labor through the history of the church. There are many Christian women today who die giving birth. So I'm not sure that we can say Paul's saying that Christian women will be protected during the childbirth process when he says she, that she will be saved through childbearing. Besides, that word saved that he uses here is actually the word that he uses for spiritual salvation, not physical salvation. So I don't think this is the correct interpretation. But a second understanding here sees the choice of, of childbearing as a word as being representative of the domestic role of women in general. Hayne Griffin, he wrote the, uh, this First Timothy commentary for the New American Commentary set uh, that's produced by Broadman and Holman, our, our publishing house. He summarized this view. He said, Paul was teaching that women prove the reality of their salvation when they become model wives and mothers whose good deeds include marriage and raising children. Now those who hold to this interpretation says Paul means that when a woman submits to God's order within the church and the home, she will have protection against the temptations to usurp the authority that men have. That's what, what is being uh, advanced here. And this is a particularly attractive interpretation given what our culture is, is advancing today. Now, it's clear the Bible puts a very high value on the domestic role of women. It puts a very high value on a woman uh, functioning in her home, running her home well, bearing children, all of those kind of things. There's a high value to that, okay? Secular feminism says those are subordinate, that those are, are terrible things, that women ought not to be locked up in the home. I can't remember if it was Gloria Steinem or Gloria Allred or which one it was who compared, or, or uh, whichever one, uh, compared uh, being a housewife to being in a concentration camp. That's just utterly ridiculous. But that is how secular feminism approaches this. They see it as not only an antiquated position, but an oppressive position to women. And, and in understanding Paul's words this way, we have a means, uh, those who hold it would say, to restoring the high honor and respect to what a woman does in her home. But that interpretation requires us to make some leaps as well that I don't know are supported in the text. First of all, we have to assume that childbearing is a catch-all phrase for everything a woman does as a wife in her home. I don't know that I can get there. I think childbearing means childbearing. I think it's not a representative word. I think that there's other things, and, and Paul uses other things, talking about home life and everything like that. And again, if we're going to say that this is uh, a preservation from the temptation to usurp authority, then we have to say that Paul's word saved is not being used in the way that he normally uses it. In fact, in the way that he uses it everywhere else that he uses it. That only in this one place he uses it in a completely different way to say preserved from temptation rather than saved spiritually. The third interpretation is the one that I think gives us the best interpretation and the best understanding of this verse, especially in the context of this passage as a whole. It's referring to the birth of a child. The birth. Now you'll notice I put the in quotation marks and there's a reason for that. First of all, in the Greek, if you look in the Greek, there's actually that definite article that comes right before the word childbearing. 
So essentially what Paul is saying is that she shall be saved through the childbearing or, or maybe a little bit more stylistically appropriate, she shall be saved through the bearing of a child. The bearing of a child. A singular situation, not multiple ones. So that's interesting. I think that's important here because when Scripture talks about things like this, it's often pointing to Jesus as the promised seed of the woman. Again, if we think back to that curse that, that God gives to the man and the woman in the garden after the fall, we see the very beginning of the gospel there in Genesis 3.15 when he promises that the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent. Praise God for that. And scripture repeatedly, the New Testament is always saying Jesus was that promised seed. Now, let's be very clear. Jesus' birth is not what saves us. Believing that Jesus was born in Bethlehem does not save you. It's his death on the cross that saves us. But his death on the cross cannot occur unless he was born. You see, before Easter can happen, Christmas has to, has to come. And so what Paul is saying here is that salvation comes through, not by, his birth. And this understanding of this admittedly difficult verse fits with what we've been studying. Listen, listen to what Philip Ryken said about it. He said, thus 1 Timothy 2 ends with the best consolation of all. It is not meant simply to cheer women up because they do not get to preach. Rather, it is meant to give hope to us all because God offers salvation from sin in Jesus Christ. Despite our fallen nature, Despite our temptations, despite the antagony that takes place in between men and women over authority, despite all of those things, God sent Jesus to be born of the woman, to be born of the Virgin Mary, her seed, and his birth meant that he had come to crush the head of the serpent, Satan. To save us from our sin. To deliver us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Praise God for that. And that is a free gift that is given to everyone who believes in faith. And so this morning I encourage you, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can put your faith in him. And ladies, I'm going to speak to you this morning because this is a difficult passage. And I've heard some pastors say this is the scariest sermon they've ever preached. I haven't been scared by this, but I have wanted to handle the word carefully, honestly, faithfully, to divide the word of truth correctly, but I'm not here to beat you over the head with it. I'm not here to condemn anyone on this. I'm presenting what I believe the scripture teaches here. And it is the, it's what the church has held for thousands and thousands of years until just recently. We have to take that into account when we come to the word. And if the word contradicts us, then we're the ones who have to change. And listen, what Paul has called you to obey, what God has called you to obey, he will empower you to obey if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Those are spiritual empowerments. The Holy Spirit gives you. If this is something you struggle with, listen, the Spirit can give you the power to, to persevere in God's order. And so if this is it, I, I encourage you this morning to, to throw this at the feet of Jesus, to commit yourself to him and to trust in him and, and his divine design. Even if it goes against what you think, if it goes against what you want, it's not because I want to hold you in suppression here. I do not. 
I mean, you heard Nicole read the word of God this morning. You've heard women pray in our service this morning, or not this morning, but, but in the past. We, we don't take that. We see a very important role for women in the life of the church. The prohibition is against the elder position, and that alone. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you that we can come to passages like this one, difficult though they may be, and learn about what your desire is for your church. Father, we know sometimes it, it, it does cut against what we want. But Father, when that happens, I pray that you give us the grace to conform to your teaching so that our lives may be representative of the gospel transformation that is available to all because of Jesus Christ. And it's because of him we ask you this morning, Lord, that if there's anyone here who does not trust in you, that you would call them to yourself this morning, that they would hear the Spirit's conviction in their life, that they would turn from their sin and turn to you, putting their faith in Christ, the one who was crucified on their behalf and who was raised again to defeat sin and death. And we will rejoice with all of heaven, Lord, for the lost one who's been saved. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.